Um, of Opadi Lectun. Um, and again, please feel free to ask questions uh, as well on this or to make your comments because I know as teachers you all are practicing some of this already. But again, a lot of times when we come to workshops like this, it reinforces our passion to go back out there and try again. Because some of the things that we try, you know, we, we're human. We get tired, we fight in the system, we're you know, we have a lot of struggles um, out there. And I know Ms. Osman um, reiterated, you know, that, that the support um, that you need out there, not only do we have to have the, the, um, the will, but we also have to have the tools to be able to do it. Because especially with, um, when we have to, to, do, um, to teach children who have certain challenges, the way to, to overcome those challenges too is to use the right tools in the classroom and to have the right programs so that you know that we do not challenge them even more by asking them to overcome barriers that exist in the classroom. So that presuming competence, um, could I have the first slide? Thank you. In the disability world, in presuming competence, I'll give you all a tool so that it means that a person with a disability has the ability to think, learn, and understand. Even if you may not see any evidence that this is the case. Because we know that in some disabilities you can't see it. In fact, I was talking to a parent just before we started, and she showed me a picture of her daughter, and her daughter looks typical. So you would not know by looking at that person that they had a disability. And again, we presume when we see a person who is in a wheelchair certain things because we can see that they're actually in a wheelchair or that if we, if we see a person who is sight impaired, we automatically have, a, you know, they say images everything. When you walk into a room, even if you're typical, they say you have one second to make that first impression. So that first impression that you have when you see the person with a disability is what sticks with you. And of course, over time, we have put a lot of labels onto people. And those labels are the misconceptions and the preconceptions that they cannot do certain things because of this term special, that they're limited, that you know, we have to take care of them. We always hear these things. And of course, that is a human reaction. We feel that we need to protect. But by protecting, sometimes we overprotect. And then what happens to their independence? You know, when we are not no longer around, and Glenn always talks about this, that parents, caregivers, they're not always going to be here. Now the lifespan of a person with disability matches the lifespan of a typical person. Years ago, you used to hear that a, a, a person with Down syndrome would only live into their 20s. Now they're living into their 60s and 70s. And that means that their parents are no longer around. So it is more and more important that we give them the life skills and the educational skills to help them function in society. Again, that would be one of the most important things about presuming competence, that we, from the very get-go, recognize that ability in the person to do things. So how can we do that? The way we think about the kids strongly affects the way our kids think about themselves. Teachers, is that true? Yes. Who, who do the kids work for in the classroom? Yes. They work for Miss, right? If they like Miss and Miss treats them nice and, tr and you talk to them, they react positively. They, they feel confident, they feel that they can speak out. If you have a teacher who is very dominating and is very unapproachable. The children withdraw. They keep quiet in the classroom. They don't want to talk. They don't want to express themselves because they're afraid they will be chastised. And imagine now a child who has a challenge coming into an environment like that. They will just withdraw even more. So starting before even in the home, the parent needs to also try to bring out that self-confidence in the child so that when they go into the classroom as well, the 
they can express themselves and the teacher then takes over. So it's reinforced behavior as well. It's not just miss to do it. It has to be consistently done. And Glenn again mentioned that he did, he was good at the push-ups and the swimming and the running because he did it every day. He didn't do it once, twice, and then stop and then come back a year after and do it. And so therefore in the classroom and in the home, the behaviors have to be reinforced all the time. Next time. So let's talk a little bit about accessible practices. And the three areas of accessible practices that we want to look at are attitudes, terminology, and disability etiquette. And I was, especially when I was doing the research for this, I said, I'm not a presumed competence expert, what's that all about? But then as I started to research and read the literature, I realized, well, maybe the universe is speaking to me because I teach etiquette and business etiquette, and I teach communications, and this is really what about a major part of what presuming competence is about. It's about how we communicate, because really the presumption of competence is, is put on us not on the person with the disability, right? It's put on us so that we change our attitude first towards that person before we even start to think about, okay, how can we teach them? So the first thing is attitudinal, and that's where the no thinking and knowing that the person can and will learn becomes very important, and then we move into the terminology. So what is terminology? Teachers. Terminology is anybody. Language, terminology, how we say something, right? It's, it's a language that we use to communicate. And what is communication? Am I communicating? Yes. I'm communicating halfway, 50%. The other part of communication is what? Feedback. So if I stand up here, and I keep asking you all questions and nobody could give me any feedback. It's either because you all are all very, very shy or um, I'm not making myself clear. So when we speak to our kids and when we speak to persons with disabilities, we have to be clear. And we also have to find out, are they understanding us? Are they understanding what we're saying to them? Are we speaking in, in language that they can understand clear, simple, are we speaking in a certain tone, um, at a certain pace as well? Not that we have to, you know, over accentuate things, but we have to know what that person's ability to respond to the communication is, because everyone is different. So, next slide. So, accessible practice, the first thing we started with was the attitudes. So we don't diss the ability in the person. We, we understand that they do have an ability and therefore we recognize that. Accessible practice in the terminology, see the person first and not the disability. So we have to change that way that we have of looking at somebody. You know, I always say when you walk in the door, someone will look at you and in a second, they watch you from head to toe. And they sum you up and they say, hmm, and they make an impression of you. And in the same way, when we see the person with the disability, we do that even more than we usually would. So terminology and how we see it. Terminology can inhibit rapport building. So that if, and again, rapport building is just building a relationship with that person. So how we speak to them, if someone's aggressive, I don't really want to talk to you again. I'll probably try to avoid you if I come into a conversation or if you, you're trying to show me that you know everything already, well then you're not really listening to what I'm saying. And a lot of us do that. And with a person with a disability, if they're trying to say something, don't stop them from finishing their sentence. They may take a little longer, but it's important to give them that time to finish the thought that they're processing. Because remember, in Down syndrome especially, it's a cognitive um, disability. So it means that they take a little more time to process. 
Um, can we just go back one? Right. Words matter, moving beyond politically correct to a question of respect. So again, respect. Big part of etiquette is respect, you know, understanding that everyone, no matter where they are from and where and what sort of position they hold, we respect them. Rule one, ask people how they want to be referred to. You know, we have pe the people first language now, but sometimes a person will tell you what they like to be called. You, you know you want to be called by your name. You don't want to be called by your disability. So that you want to know how do they like to be referred to. Um, avoid outdated terms like handicap, cripple, retarded, physically challenged, differently able. All of these are terms that, you know, we don't use these terms anymore, right? Because again, we are seeing the person and not the disability. And in fact, the R word is now like a, a bad word. Internationally, there's a movement against that. So we don't even think about that word anymore. Disability etiquette, disability not always a presenting a problem. So I have a disability, I have a few. You know, if I was reading from the script, I definitely have on my glasses. If I didn't, I could not see. And I'm sure if I walked around the room, everybody in here could tell you a one or two that they have, whether it's their knees, their hips, their joints, you know, their sight, whether they're hearing okay. And then a couple of ladies say, I can't hear, I can't hear, you know? So we all have a disability, but that's not what we want to be judged by. It also doesn't mean that I want help. You know, I can do it myself. Again, once I'm given the tools to be able to help me to do what I need to do. So making sure that, they, that a person with a disability has the advantage of using technology and using tools to help them to navigate and make places accessible and things accessible to them. Whether it is, we had a senator here for the World Down Syndrome Day conference and he um, was sight impaired, but he used his mobile phone, he used a computer, in, and he's a senator in Jamaica. So he's fully, fully functional. Um, he's had, he actually is a professor at the University of the West Indies in, on the Mona campus. And so he has embraced the technology in order to make him totally functional. And went back to school, he tells his story, or when he, did, he wasn't born um, sight impaired, but he acquired the disability at a very young age in his teens, and he actually went to university with his disability, got his uh, undergraduate, got his master's, went on now to get his doctorate and everything. But he had to have, make, things had to be accessible to him in order to help him to navigate the system. So we really do need those tools. I wish Ms. Osman was here because that's what I know a lot of the teachers need. You all need the tools, so tablets, and so for, the for persons with autism, tablets are something that help them a lot, you know, and other, other things in the classroom. And treat others as you would have them treat you. They just want to be treated just like you. Um, and I came upon this, which I think is really something that we do all do. I do it too sometimes. Mm -hmm and it's called inspiration porn. You know, when we overpraise a person with a disability because we think, oh wow, they could sing. Oh gosh, they could dance. Yes, he could do this. He, he really bathed himself and he's 12 years old, but anybody at 12 should be bathing themselves and going to the dinner table and washing up the wares after and so on if they were taught and trained that they needed to do these things. If you leave your typical child and tell them they don't have to do chores, wouldn't they be outside playing and doing nothing and be not helping you in the house? So we have to make sure that we also encourage them and not over praise a person because of that, right? Because that is what is natural and normal and age appropriate. An 18 year old should not be you know, told that they cannot go to the movies with a brother or sister or with, fr with a friend, they're 18. If they want to drink a beer and try it, and you know, nothing wrong with that. I don't mean you have to make them alcoholic, but at 18, they should have a choice as well. You know, we, we run away. 
then the uh, hardly anybody in Trinidad and Tobago, and even internationally, when Brett Glenn travels, who wants to talk about sex. You know, and your, your young person is going to grow up into an adult, and we have to also talk about their sexual feelings, wants, needs, desires. It's not, it, and we push it under the carpet, because that's not something we talk about. But a person with a disability doesn't mean that they don't have sexual urges just like everybody else. And how do we deal with that? So we really have to have some of these necessary, important talks. You know, we have to bring it out into the open and not be, not be embarrassed to broach these subjects. They're not going to run away. They're not going to go away. Um, so again, in particular, because we're talking about Down syndrome here in the workshop, with cognitive disabilities, presume competence, unless you are informed otherwise, adults make their own decisions. When we go away, we see the kids using their credit card. You know, the young adults, they go into the coffee shops and they swipe their card. And because, again, it has become the norm. They didn't just wake up at 18 and somebody give them a card and say, go to the coffee shop. They wouldn't know what to do with it. But it is part of the socializing and the occupational type of therapy as well, learning to do these things. Speak in clear sentences using concrete rather than abstract concepts. Don't use baby talk or talk down. Gauge the pace and complexity as you go. So that's where the communication skills come in because you have to get the feedback. So you're going, you're having the conversation, you're acknowledging things, you're getting them to talk back to you. We had a fabulous conversation when we were in Tobago the last time at the school for the deaf with um, one of the young ladies there. And Glenn and I, we, we talked about it for days after because she was answering. She really, we didn't presume her competence. We went in there thinking, oh, when we saw her, no, this person, they're not going to cut it. And really, she put us to shame. <laughs> really, really put us to shame. And she is a prospective candidate for um, one of the mentorship jobs here in Tobago because we have um, had conversations with Magdalena and another, um, the cast, office of the Prime Minister cast yes. in Tobago, and they would like to take um, a couple of our kids into their um, employment under the mentorship program. So we are not leaving out to be at all. We're working on it. But we have to have our kids ready. Because when, the, and this is the problem that we have now, even in Trinidad, the companies, we are, we are going out there, we're talking like this, and we, you know, we, we're talking big. And, and now the companies are coming out of the shell and they want the, they want the diversity in the workplace. And the problem now is we don't have the kids at the standard because we have not been presuming competence, right? And we need to start now to make sure that this group of young people coming up, that they can read, they can write, they can, you know, even if they cannot, they're not um, verbally communicative, that they have a way to communicate. Kelly, who works at Central Bank, she did the tours um, with in the Central Bank Museum, and they had a group who were not able, um, that were hearing impaired. And Kelly, who has Down syndrome, knows sign language. And so as soon as she saw the group coming in, she started doing sign language. Well, of course, you know, the officials at Central Bank were blown away because again, they didn't know that she was competent in sign language because she is verbal and she does speak. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes these kids do so much more than we do. Kelly dances, she plays pan, She's, she won four medals at the Special Olympics in Abu Dhabi, you know, riding horses. Hello, we don't ride horses. We run away from horses, most of us. Um, and decisions may come slowly, but be patient and allow time for them to absorb everything. You could go ahead. Okay, to expectations. Remember, there's much research about expectations, and children perform to the level of expectation of parents and teachers. So read that again. Eh? They perform to the level of expectation 
of the parents and teachers. So we have to set the bar high. And as, as they accomplish one thing, you raise it again. So they're always tapping into right. that potential that they have. And these are just some pictures of the um, young people, the self-advocates that we've been talking about. Rochelle is nine years old and she bakes. So we've named her company for her, Rochelle Sweet Treats. And she was the one that we featured in the World Down Syndrome Day video this year. She went to the Hyatt and she baked with the Hyatt's pastry chef. And they again, blown away. They handed her a piping bag and the chef was about to put on the little um, tube at the end. And Rochelle said, no, I want a number five. Well, oh God, you should have seen his face. Because he didn't think that a nine-year-old with Down syndrome would know anything about piping bags. But she knows her business, so she's going to have a company soon. And then we have Shabla Maraj, who you see all the time on TTT. She's now an announcer, has cerebral palsy. She just graduated with her master's from the University of the West Indies in agriculture. I do need. Um, I do so not need. Um, Middle and Tyrese buddies, real buddies, party buddies. They love to dance. They love to have a good time. But both working young men, jobs. Surya, last week the boss there implemented a new system um, of clocking in and came and told me that Surya is the only one who had 100% um, punctuality and was the only employee who did the procedure for the entire week. No other employee did it every single day, although they're supposed to. But he followed the rules. He was told and he knows this is the right thing to do and he's doing it. And of course, Tyrese, exceptional in the warehouse. Same thing with his punctuality. He fired the boss about 10 times already from coming late. <laughs> and Lisa Sawyer is working as a barista at the Cinnamon Cafe at Hyatt Regency in Port Spain. And she just participated in their Sports and Family Day as the um, team lead for her team, which actually won the Sports Day. She was Superwoman. And she looked really, really good. And she also just did um, she modeled for Wonderful World, this store, uh, in their leisure catalog for this year. So she'll be in their catalog in beautiful caftans and so on. Her, the staff at Hyatt was so jealous because they said, we said, is she really going to model for them? I said, yes, she is, you know? So people are embracing our self-advocates and because they are believing, starting to believe what we are saying. And that is what we want, you know, for people to have that confidence. And the more that they do that, is the more opportunity we will have out there for them as well. And so this is my last slide. But so let's get rid of the labels and really create these endless possibilities. And this wise man, Albert Einstein, he said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you keep telling somebody they can't do it, even for me, I know the little hang-ups I have are because somebody, when I was young, told me something, and he said, you can't sing. You know? Well, now I sing, but I only sing at church. You know, because it really made me feel very self-conscious, you know? But you should make yourself happy if you want to sing, sing. You know, but we put these things onto our kids, these inhibitions. And so therefore we must really try to take those things away so they have a clean slate, like like Miss Osmond said, to be able to write their own part and write their own life to independence. So thank you for listening and I hope um, you can take something away.